Of the three main modes of heat transfer, conductive, convective, and radiative, conductive deals with heat passed through solids. In conductive heat transfer, you pass heat directly from one molecule to another molecule that's touching it. So not only do you have to have the molecules in contact with each other to transfer heat, but you also need to have a solid because the molecules do not move as they pass heat. It's sort of a gradient that goes from one point outward or one side to another. So remember, conductive heat transfer deals with solids. Let's take a look at what a conductive heat transfer problem looks like in steady state. In this problem, we have a metal shed standing in open field. We're given information about the dimensions of the shed and the heat transfer properties of the shed in terms of thermal conductivity. We know the outside temperature, and we also know the rate of heat transfer. So we want to figure out what's the temperature at the inside of the shed wall. How do we know that this heat transfer problem is talking about conductive heat transfer and not a different type of heat transfer? Look at what the question is asking. We're asked what the temperature at the inside of the shed wall is. So right now we know we're talking about the inside of the wall, not the air inside, which would be a convective problem because air is a fluid and convective heat transfer deals with fluids. So right now we know we're dealing with the wall. We're also given the rate of heat transfer through the wall. That's from one side of the wall to the other. And so that's through a solid. Since we are dealing with heat transfer through a solid, this is a conductive heat transfer problem. We'll start this problem by drawing our diagram. Diagrams are important for sorting out all the information you're giving and figuring out which way is the heat supposed to be going. All right, there's our shed. We know the outside temperature is 32 C, but we don't know which way the heat's going. We don't know if the inside of the shed is warm or cold until we look and see that 270 kilojoules of heat are transferred through the wall to the inside. So the heat transfer is going this way. That means since we set our heat transfer equation from this perspective of the inside of the object we're looking at, we have a positive Q because heat is going into that shed. So we know Q is positive, the shed is heating up, therefore the inside temperature should be lower than the outside temperature, otherwise we couldn't get heat transfer into the shed. It would be going out of the shed. So again, Q is positive. We have heat going into this shed. In terms of the dimensions we are given, we are given the length of the wall, we're given the height of the wall, and we are given our wall thickness. We don't know anything about a roof on the shed or the floor of the shed, but that's okay because we're told to ignore the heat transfer through the ground and the shed roof. So we're going to skip that for now. Let's write down our heat transfer equation. This heat transfer equation is the Fourier equation for heat transfer. We are going to assume that heat is being transferred one dimensionally through the thickness of the wall because the wall is big enough that heat transfer is faster through the thickness of a wall than it is along the length or up and down the height. All right, there's our Fourier equation. Notice we have the negative sign in front of our K, thermal conductivity. That's to make sure the heat transfer goes the right way. Delta x in this equation, the wall thickness, is always negative because of where we set the zero point for x. So know when you're doing this, delta x is always negative. That means the sign on q is controlled by your TO minus TI term. If TO is bigger than TI, like it's going to be in this particular example, then q is positive and heat is flowing into the area. If TI is bigger than TO, q is negative and heat is flowing out of the area. The negative just tells you the direction of the heat flow. We have most of the information needed to solve this problem. We have Q, we have K, the thermal conductivity. We have delta X, the wall thickness. What we need to figure out is the area of heat transfer. And this is the area the heat is transferring through. We're given the dimensions of the shed and we're told to ignore the ground and ignore the roof. Four walls typically make up a shed, 
So we have heat being transferred through four walls. Those walls have a length and a height, and that's the surface area the heat is being transferred through. So our area equation ends up looking like this. For each wall, we multiply length times height to get that surface area. We have four walls, so we're going to put a four out in front. That takes care of our area. All right, we're all set. We have everything we need to solve the problem. Before we start plugging in numbers, though, let's rearrange to get Ti by itself. There we go. Now Ti is by itself. Now we can plug everything in and solve for Ti. Let's do that. Okay, the answer is 27.1 degrees C. Let's point out a couple of things I did here. First, that 270 kilojoules of heat transferred every minute needs to get converted to watts. We're in kilojoules and we need to go to watts. So to go from kilojoules to joules, I multiply by a thousand. Then, because 270 kilojoules are transferred every minute, not every second, and watts is a joule per second, I need to divide by 60 to get that term correct. When you do that, Q is equal to 4,500 watts. 4,500 watts is Q. Notice that we do need to convert the wall thickness to meters. So this is converting the 1.1 centimeters to meters. And here, this little negative sign is because, remember, delta x is always negative. So you have to put a little negative sign right there to make your number come out right. Otherwise, ti is going to be bigger than to, which is not possible because q is positive. Therefore, ti is smaller than to. So just remember those couple of tricks. Make sure your units are consistent with these problems. If they're not, you're going to end up with some very odd heat transfer rates or very odd thermal conductivities or very odd temperatures. But that's basically all there is to solving a conductive problem. Just keep track of those signs, keep track of your units, and your answers should come out accurate.